recognize everybody by saying, what's up, guys? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Len, you ready? Yeah. We welcome in a man that doesn't let one thing define him. But if you want to try, you can start by calling him a consensus All-American, first team All-ACC, and two-time second team All-ACC player. He scored 3,948 points over his 10-year pro career between five organizations, both in the ABA and NBA. If there was a missed shot, you knew where to find him. A man of many trades off the court, an education grad from Maryland, a JD from Harvard, an attorney, college hoops announcer, and senior lecturer in the sports management program at Columbia. Ivy might as well be his favorite color as he spent a lot of time in that league. Standing at 6'9", the only thing that phases this guy is the Apple iOS software update. We'll stay away from talking any trash to avoid taking out the garbage. We welcome in a living legend, Len Elmore. What's going on? Gentlemen, it's nice to be with you. It is a pleasure having you on a, on quite a momentous day for this country. And we just wanted to really say, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. And we're really looking to dive into you know, the life you've had and the playing career and everything you've done post. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and you're right, it is a momentous day. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's really revel in the optimism going forward. Yeah, and I couldn't, couldn't say it any better than that. And, and what I like to do is start out with the early life, a little before you were in the professionals. You were in the Brooklyn Housing Projects in 1952, and I think that can do a lot to help shape a man and a player for what they become. And I wanted to kick it to Brad, since I know he's had a quest, some questions about how your childhood shaped you. Yeah, so, so Len, I, I graduated with a degree in economics, so I tend to look at everything from that aspect first. And I'm curious, you know, when I look at the history of the Brooklyn economy, it looks like you were coming of age, you know, well after that World War II construct, reconstruction period and more so the late cycle capitalism, white flight period of Brooklyn with inequality and, and crime. I'm curious, did you feel any of that economic anxiety as you were a young teenager, whether it be through you personally or your parents? Well, I would say this, Brad, the economic anxiety certainly existed. I mean, I have, my dad uh, didn't get past the 10th grade. Uh, he was a World War II veteran uh, stationed over in Japan in the um, occupational forces. Uh, and my mom, who was uh, a high school graduate, actually salutatorian, her school, she had an HBCU scholarship, but she couldn't take it because her family in dirt poor part of Louisiana it was so poor that they had to send her to New York to work with my aunt uh, to send money at home. Uh, so, you know, we did grow up in the projects. Interestingly enough, though, in those projects, there were um, a, a mix of people, relatively diverse, primarily black and Jewish, uh, many of whom were um, post-war um, folks who were striving. And, and eventually that, um, that white flight did occur. Uh, but, you know, we flew out of there as well. My mom and dad both uh, wound up getting, uh, uh, getting passing grades on civil service exams uh, for the city of New York and, and became city employees. My father was a sanitation man. My mother worked as a clerk and we moved to a small house with my grandparents in Queens, which is a working class neighborhood south jamaica springfield gardens um uh, where in that neighborhood everyone uh it was primarily black and everyone uh was a, a city or, or a state or federal employee you were either a policeman a sanitation man a postal worker a fireman and, and so that was kind of the uh, the meat of, of of my uh development um you know certainly my up until the fourth grade, I was in the projects, but then after that, we moved to that neighborhood in Queens. So, you know, we had a taste of uh, of that life, both uh, from a somewhat anxious economic standpoint to a little more relaxed. But um, we were never at a point where my parents could say we have made it because we continue to strive. I'm curious, you know, today is a special day being Inauguration Day, and I think the effect that you know, jobs programs and, and government uh, uh, positions maybe have had on your life are especially, you know, relevant to you. Does this day mean something to you more than, than others? 
Well, I mean, of course, uh, it, it means something in that um, we have to focus on optimism. The last four years have been difficult uh, for any number of people, any number of people who are uh, freedom loving, uh, focused on the democratic process and on uh, transparency, uh, honesty and, and servant leadership. We were lacking that over the last four years. And I don't mind saying it. You know, now we have an opportunity with someone uh, under both uh, the president and the vice president who were, um, you know, officers in uh, as elected officials and and who seem to uphold those elements that uh, the people strive for. You may not uh, believe in everything that they believe in from a political standpoint, uh, you know, philosophically uh, on the political spectrum. But nevertheless, I think the honesty element, the transparency, the truthfulness, uh, I think is something that both of them have stood for in, in their careers. And, and we are going back to that. That's something we've become used to as, as a nation. And, and we lost that for four years. And now hopefully we will uh, regain uh, that momentum as a nation where we can now start to unite. Yeah, and agreed with everything you said. And Len, I appreciate you shedding some light on your upbringing because I think for a lot of times, the average fan might assume that, you know, you've come from a family of athletes or that it was always handed to you. Um, and that's not always the case. You played your high school ball at Power Academy in New York, and this was known as a, quote, powerhouse as it's produced some notable NBA affiliates, including yourself, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Chris Mullen, and the Iron Horse referee himself, Dick Bavetta. But basketball wasn't always in your cards. And the question don't you want to play a sport with someone your own side? <laughs> it's been one of the most influential things said to you because you might have not known which way you were supposed to run after the initial tip off, but that quickly <laughs> changed. You yeah, led, it did. <laughs> and, and you know what? You led them to a 22 0 record and the number one ranking in the nation your senior year. In addition to basketball, it seems like this really, this school really helped shape you as a person. The guidance from Lake Coach, and I apologize if I butcher his name, Jack Cooner. That's correct. Okay. And some of the teachers really helped stress and discipline, responsibility, and the strength of education. Now, staying with your basketball career for now, your success didn't go unnoticed because you ultimately earned a scholarship at the University of Maryland, and you were the man on campus, earning co-captain status, being a three-time All-ACC player, an All-American in 1974, and you owned the rebounding category at Maryland. <laughs> you are still the all-time leader in rebounds in a game, season, and career. I just want to say Windex should have approached you for a sponsorship as you cleaned the boards. But I know that Brad has a question he wants to ask about your college career and a game in particular. I did. So we talked with Adrian Dantley, and he took pride in being the team that was able to end Bill Walton's win streak. And I saw that your Maryland team lost to him by one point. I'd be interested to hear what you and your team's mindset was entering that game. Well, we had uh, we had viewed Bill and his awesome team uh, his junior year when they beat uh, Memphis State, and Bill actually shot twenty three out of twenty four, I believe, was the uh, the number from the field, if you can believe that. And you know, I took pride in my defense. You know, as as mentioned, you know, you talk about. Uh, a lot of my records, I mean, I could score, but uh, on this team with Tom McMillan and, and John Lucas, I was like the third option. But um, I took a lot of pride in my defense. And, you know, I said to myself, knowing that they were the first game we played the next year, I said, 23 out of 24, that's not happening. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I took that tape and I watched that videotape all summer. Um, you know, I, in my dreams, I could see. Uh, what Bill was doing and what he was going to do. And, you know, our mindset was, you know, we are as good as anyone. Certainly Coach Drizel had built uh, the program up as, you know, potentially, and I emphasize potentially the UCLA of the East, recognizing UCLA's dominance um, and, and thought that Maryland with the resources they had, the location, playing in a league like the ACC, we had the potential to be that dominant. So, you know, now, uh, you know, dominance, uh, dreams of dominance and destiny uh, would meet reality when we went out to to, to um, the Pauley Pavilion in Los Angeles. And so we were ready to play. Uh, unfortunately, um, we came up short playing at Pauley. We lose by one. 
Um, you know, we had an opportunity to win the game in the last possession. We outscored them in the last three minutes, nine zip, uh, you know, held them scoreless. But, you know, we had possession down one and John Lucas gets hand checked out of bounds. Um, of course, uh, the late Booker Turner, who uh, was a prominent ref and ultimately became the, uh, the supervisor of referees in the Pac-8 at the time. His nickname, unfortunately, was Booker, Booker Bruin. So you know, we knew <laughs> we knew what we were in for, and, and ultimately it came to pass. However, you know, my idea of being able to stand up to to Bill Walton came to pass. I mean, blocked his first two shots, um, and he shot eight for twenty four that game. So we knew twenty three out of twenty four was not happening. Um, you, you know, I, I think I had eighteen and fifteen, um, but as I said, we came up short. Uh, what was it 65, 64, something like that. And, you know, we acquitted ourselves well. Uh, AD and, and um, you know, those guys, uh, you know, I, I think John Shoemate, who was the center for that team and a friend of mine, they were fortunate to play them at Notre Dame. Had we gotten UCLA at our place, I suspect we probably would have beaten them by 10. But, you know, if, uh, you know, got if if those kinds of wishes came true, you know we obviously all would uh, would be very happy. But you know that's destiny. Glenn, I knew that you were meticulous doing my research, but when you told me that you spent the summer before looking at film, Bill Walton shot ninety six percent going twenty three of twenty four, and then to shoot thirty three percent shooting eight of twenty four, really just shows me another level of your preparation. So that's really cool to hear and. You know, during your time at Maryland, you attended a pivotal time for this country. As this was in the early 1970s as the Vietnam War was going on. And as an athlete, you were instructed not to join the protests or you might lose your scholarship. But you found other ways to be involved. And as an English major, you found activism in the classroom through your writing and the interpretations of literary, literary texts that you ventured into during discussions. Outside of the classroom, you led an after-school program for junior high kids nearby in Seat Pleasant, ultimately earning the University of Maryland Citizenship Award upon graduation. So an impact on and off the court. But I know Coach James wanted to ask you a question about a certain game not against UCLA. Yeah, and I, I think it was funny that um, you're saying kind of putting dreams into reality, whether that's uh, guarding Bill Walton or becoming president i think like as a coach and teacher I, thinking about those things and putting them into play definitely help it's definitely a coachable thing that i do so I'm glad that you mentioned that um you played on a legendary turps team you won 81 percent of your games when you played it really changed the thought of the university of maryland basketball as a bona fide winning uh program and my grandparents they met each other at at maryland and um i would always hear about this legendary team and and how damn good you guys were. Um, I want to touch on what's called the greatest ACC game of all time. That's, of course, the 1974 ACC championship after losing by one to the same team two years prior, um, and then a 103-100 overtime loss to NC State with the likes of David Thompson. Um, Tom Burleson on the other side was quoted saying, uh, I think we just beat the second best team in the nation tonight. Um, I've seen so many teams win an NCAA championship after losing their conference tournament. Of course, it's unfortunate to be on the other end of history, um, but the NCAA would change that rule for the better. Um, and now one, more than one team from the conference can go to that NCAA tournament. What's your, your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, that's uh, the only solace that we could get from from losing to uh, NC State. I mean, there's no question that they were a better team, maybe by just that much. But, you know, they found a way. Um, and for the most part, David Thompson was the difference, either, you know, scoring, um, you know, 35, 40 points against us individually or creating, you know, such a threat that other guys got a chance to get off. I mean, I, I look at Tom Burleson, who had the game of his life, take nothing away from him uh, in that one game, simply because I was only playing him halfway prior, prior to that. Um, I had guarded him one game. He shot three of 19 from the field. And, you know, at seven, four, he is a difficult guy to deal with. But, you know, I found a way. And in this game, we decided we we're going to try to 
keep David Thompson from hurting us. So I kind of had to focus on him everywhere he went. I would kind of get in the lane and try to take the lane away. But they did a great job of reversing the ball. And by the time I got to my man at 7'4", he was like two feet in the paint. And at 6'9", with a seven-inch advantage uh, and a little bit of luck, you know, he had his way. And, and I have to tip my cap to, to Tommy because, you know, that was that was a game for him to have. Uh, but again, we're our solace is that the NCAA did see the absurdity of the number one team in the nation and number four team in the nation playing each other in, in a conference, and one of them was going to go home. Uh, and the following year, they expanded the field, uh, recognizing that uh, they couldn't have that again. And, and so, if, if nothing else, we changed history. But uh, you know, I, I, I would gladly trade that for a win in that game, no question about it, because I think we had an opportunity to, to win a national championship. And we, to this day, we believe that if the field was expanded, um, and out of those three years that we played, we might have gotten one. Yeah, and it's unfortunate, you know, I, we all grow up and live in Maryland and are huge Maryland fans, and we'd love to see another banner up there in addition with that 2002. Um, Len, I love the optimism, and regardless of the outcome, your success at the collegiate level didn't go unnoticed because you ultimately played at the highest level of competitive basketball, getting drafted by the Washington Bullets in 1974. You would never play for them, however, as you chose the Indiana Pacers instead. And what I think is interesting is the ABA policy was that if any team thinks it can sign a player, it need only ask the league for permission. So you actually preferred to play in Washington, but your lawyer, Norman Blass, I hope I said that right. Yes, you did. Got, a, got you a multi-year contract that was the third largest that year behind Bill Walton and Tom Burleson, who we've talked a little bit about on this pod. There was a substantial difference in the offer between those teams, which played a huge part in your signing. Len, you're an educated man, and I read you wanted to be a lawyer since you were a kid. I can see why you would take the bigger paycheck, but was any part of you thinking about making a counteroffer to Washington to see how much they valued your services? Well, we did. And um, and before he passed away and, and during an interview that I had uh, with Abe Poland at the time, looking he was looking for a general manager and he wanted to talk to me. Um, he admitted that that was probably one of the biggest mistakes he ever made, not getting involved in the negotiation. But let's face it. First of all, we did our homework, recognize that uh, there was going to be uh, an absorption of some ABA teams. People call it a merger, but the NBA really absorbed the four uh, most prominent, most lucrative teams, the ones who are most financially stable, and the Pacers were definitely one of them. And them having my rights, uh, you know, and recognize that the offer that they made was substantially higher, as you mentioned. You know, they offered me a, a six-year guarantee. Washington offered a two-year, a three-year contract with two years guaranteed, which turned out to be, uh, you know, a, a godsend that I made the choice to play with the Pacers because in my third year, I actually ruptured tendons in my right knee and missed just about all of the season. Um, and so, you know, if I had taken the Washington deal, I might not have had a chance uh, to have any financial security going forward. So, you know, it was uh, it, it was one of those kinds of situations where I was very fortunate, but smart enough for us to do our homework and, and make a, an informed decision. And I definitely think you made the right one, A, for the financial aspect, but B, the first two seasons for the Pacers organization, you definitely made your mark after averaging six and a half points and five and a half or over five rebounds as a rookie, you really came onto the senior second year. You averaged a double double with 14.6 points per game, 10.8 rebounds per game, including three on the offensive end, 2.3 blocks per game and almost two steals in fantasy basketball. That would be a real asset. But I know that James has a question about kind of the ABA experience. Absolutely. So in your first year, uh, you make it to the ABA Finals, so you're playing alongside um, and who finally got in Hall of Fame, George McGinnis. He led the playoffs in points, rebounds, and assists. You called him the LeBron before LeBron. Absolutely. Um, and um, he matched. You matched up against another Hall of Famer, an artist Gilmore, and, and you know you had your hands full there, but you knew how to play against big men. I mean, you've been doing it up until this point in your career. Um, you ultimately come up short. What did you gain from that experience? 
Um, and did you feel like this is it? I made it. I mean, you're a big part of that 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 finals and, and playing a lot of minutes trying to guard the likes of um, Artis Gilmore. Well, I mean, James, I, I've never, ever said I've made it. Uh, you know, I, I continue to say I'm getting there, even at this <laughs> ripe age. Uh, but, you know, I recognize that, that I did have the skill. I mean, starting with the Pacers, I started out slowly, uh, not really recognizing what, what uh, Bob Leonard, Slick Leonard wanted, our coach. Uh, and so initially I didn't play a whole lot, but my minutes gradually came. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about the totality of, of my numbers that year, but towards the end of the season, I really started to come on. In fact, the first playoff game against the San Antonio Spurs with Ice Gervin, James Silas, um, a bunch of other guys, Swen Nader, um, uh, you know, George Carl and those guys, uh, I, I had 30 points in that first game, including, you know, the game winner. Um, and so throughout that series, we beat a, a great San Antonio team. Um, then the next series, we played a Denver uh, Rockets team coached by Larry Brown that had not lost a game at home. And in the playoffs, uh, in that series, we beat them in the last three games. We beat them on the road at, at Denver. And so we were um, very confident. But then we come up against the Kentucky Colonels team. Yeah. had some great players, uh, including Artis Gilmore. But, you know, they had other guys who, who could really get the job done. Hubie Brown was the coach there. Ironically, I wound up playing for Hubie Brown in my last, in my last season with the Knicks. But, um, you know, I, I thought – that I belonged in the following year, uh, I was given, you know, more uh, opportunity to prove myself along with my, my teammate, Billy Knight. Uh, you know, we made the playoffs again that year, but uh, you know, I was really feeling as though, yes, I, I did belong recognizing that the merger was coming the following year, but uh, in training camp, I wrecked my knee and never really got a chance to play in, in that first year of the merger. And, Beyond that, you know, once you're hurt, once you're hurt like that, unless you're an absolute superstar, they look at you as kind of damaged goods and you got to start all over again, which, you know, I did. Um, you know, I got to play seven more years after that, um, but it took a while before I became a starter again in the NBA. Yeah, I, I saw that when you did become a starter, you, you got to the New Jersey Nets and then you're playing alongside two uh, Maryland alums, two yeah. rookies and, and Albert King and, and Buck Williams. How was that experience playing with three Maryland guys in the front court? Well, first, it was great. Every time you, you got on the floor, either at home or on the road, and the uh, public address announcer would announce your name and the school you went to. And, of course, when they announced the front line, from Maryland, number 44, from Maryland, number 52, from Maryland. Number, you know, they got tired of saying from Maryland. And, in fact, I, I think that um, – for the amount of games that we all played together, I think it was like 79, 81 games, something like that. Um, uh, we probably hold a record for, you know, three guys from the same school as starters. Um, you know, I know that's what a trivia buffs to, to determine, but it was a great opportunity because here I was a, a grizzled veteran playing with two outstanding rookies. You know, Buck Williams became um, a, a terrific player. He was an outstanding rebounder in Maryland as well, although he didn't break my record, and I keep it <laughs> uh, But um, And Albert King was an outstanding scorer. And, you know, we started out 2-14. and 14. I, When I got to that team uh, and during their second game, I was traded from Milwaukee, um, and where I went from being a backup center and a backup power forward to a starting center. Um, we started out two and fourteen because we were a mix of grizzled veterans and, and, and first and second year players. But ultimately, we righted the ship, wound up winning forty plus games, and made the playoffs that year. Uh, a lot of it had to do with Larry Brown's coaching, and, and you know who I consider probably the best coach I ever played for in, in the pros. And you know, and and, and the temerity, the uh, stick to itiveness, and perseverance, obviously, of, of the young players, particularly Buck and Albert. And, you know, we had guys like uh, James Bailey from Rutgers who could really leap to the sky, Michael Korn from North Carolina, um, and then the veterans like Ray Williams, um, the late Ray Williams, who was a terrific scorer, uh, Clarence Footswalker, an outstanding uh, point guard, uh, Darwin Cook, a guy a lot of people don't know, I went to Portland, uh, but he was a terrific utility guy. 
And then we have Otis Birdsong. I mean, it just just a number of guys who were cast offs at one time, but you know, we gelled together to, to really become a force. So Len, I you know, it's very unfortunate about the knee injuries at a young age, as I feel like you showed some real promise. You had the athleticism, you were very coachable. And in terms of basketball, you'd been playing a relatively short time compared to others. But before we transition, I know that you know your career high in points and rebounds. You had 35 and 19 versus Marvin News Barnes, your former teammate during those college tournaments in the St. Louis Spirit. But I want to know, do you know what you shot from the field and from the free throw line that game? <laughs> no. <laughs> Go so, ahead, Eric. You're going to tell me. Don't so embarrass. you know what Bill Walton shot at, uh, in a game, but you don't know what you shot your career high? I, you know, I honestly, I, I was never concerned about my numbers. Like I said, I took pride in my defense, you know. Okay. Well, that's surprising. It feels like it feels like you have perfect recall practically. You know everybody's stats and heights and weights. Well, and, I knew I had 35 points that game. I wasn't I, sure about yeah. that. Yeah, so I saw But I, I, I do I, know I played against uh Marvin Moses and actually Luke, Maurice Lucas. That was a heck of a front line to be able to do that kind of damage, though. I know that. There so I was gonna I was gonna ask you if you knew your career high, but I saw in another interview that you said it. So you shot 15 of 26 from the field that game, five of nine from the line, and played all 48 minutes. So pretty good stat line. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a little bit of game. Good. Okay, a little bit. <laughs> but when I'm a believer in things happening for a reason, and obviously I don't wish injury upon anyone, but it seemed like your situation for it was a catalyst for going to law school. And you would begin that law degree at Harvard in the fall of 1984, and after you graduated, you succeeded quickly in the legal field. You handled mostly robberies, assaults, and larcenies to begin with, and you got a lot of notoriety from your peers. And being on the other side of sports, the business side, you started your own firm, Precept Sports. Did I say it okay? Pre Precept. Okay, I'm two for three today. I'll take that. <laughs> but not only did you have the intelligence to represent them, but your company stressed pro athletes, particularly black athletes, on giving back to the community. And you represented Derek Steele and Walt Williams, both local legends, but played different sports. But if you thought the book on Len was over, oh, it's far from it. Because if you're a millennial like us, you didn't grow up watching Len play, but you heard his energetic voice calling basketball games. Across your 31-year sports television announcing career, you worked with ESPN, CBS Sports, and Fox Sports slash FS1 calling notable games, including the Christian Leitner game-winning shot over Kentucky in 1992. Len, currently you are a senior lecturer in the Columbia University Sports Management Program, right? That's correct. Where you were awarded the 2019 Dean's Excellence Award, and you currently serve as a director on the public company board. Um, of eight of one eight hundred flowers dot com, and you are a commissioner on the Knight Commission for Intercollegiate Athletics, where you chair on racial equality task force. And although twenty twenty might have been a bad year for most, in August you were appointed to the board of advisors for the Shirley Povich Center at the University of Maryland College Park Merrill School of Journalism. So, Len, you have accomplished so much in your life. And believe me, I left out a lot for those that were wondering. <laughs> you overcame a difficult childhood. You played basketball at the highest level. You got a law degree from arguably the most prestigious school in America. You ran your own law firm. You commentated games. You currently teach master's courses and have won numerous accolades throughout your career. Is there any job or position or career field that you would have liked to work in that you haven't? Wow. Um, I, you know, I've been very blessed to be able to do what I have always wanted to do. And, and, you know, sometimes those things hadn't come to me until, you know, they had presented themselves. Um, you know, it, it goes back to growing up as a kid. I, I read a biography of Paul Robeson and, you know, Paul Robeson was a, a renaissance man, obviously an all-American football player played in the NFL for a period of time that, that helped him work his way through law school at Columbia Law School, um, at NYU, then Columbia. Uh, he also played in the Negro Leagues, played baseball. Uh, but, you know, he was obviously an outspoken proponent for equal rights and human rights. 
and uh, a concert singer as well as an actor. And having you know so many uh, of those skills was just so attractive to me. And I guess in the back of my mind, you know, I said that you know there are a lot of things I'd like to do, and let's see if I can do them. So I, you know, I've been given opportunity, been able to, um, you know, to to take the opportunity and, and make it work for me. You know, I give a lot of credit to my parents, particularly my mother, as I mentioned. You know, she lived in a dirt poor. Uh, on a dirt poor sharecropper farm in Louisiana, yet got a scholarship to an HBCU, but never got the chance to do it. She and my father kind of sacrificed when we got that home, that little house in uh, Queens. Um, I can tell you that, you know, the the yard was, as I say, it was about as big as a postage stamp until you had to mow it. Then it felt like it was Central Park. Uh, and, and then they finished the basement. Uh, I had a little area where we would call a library, except the little uh, bookshelves only had a couple of sets of books. One was Bible stories and the other uh, were uh, encyclopedias that they went in debt to, to get for us. And so that kind of sacrifice really, um, really impressed upon me the importance of education. You know, to this day, I'm proud of the fact that my wife and I, who James, by the way, I went my wife at the University of Maryland. So, you know, that's uh, tell your grandparents we have something in common. The school uh, of love. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, we're proud that our kids are able to get the finest education. We've got a Princeton graduate who's got a master's from the Citadel. We've got a Columbia uh, undergrad who also has got an MBA from Columbia Business School. Uh, so we, we imparted that, that importance to, to them as well. And so when you say, are there things that I would like to have done? Um, you know, I, I look at this election of the president of the United States, but I realize that's not really what I wanted to do because had I wanted to do it, I probably would have pursued it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy where I am. Uh, as I said, I'm blessed. I've had impact. Uh, you know, I've tried to do the right thing throughout and I've tried to influence particularly young people that, uh, you know, your, your fortunes are based upon your effort and your preparedness. And, you know, if you are focused on doing and being, you can do and you can be. If you ever decide to run for office, you have my vote. We are speaking with Len Elmore, 10 year NBA, ABA veteran, great all around guy and a man of all trades. Len, we like to get our guests out of here on this a little uh, rapid fire, this or that. You up for it? Uh, let's do it. Can't guarantee right. you'll get the answers you want, but. All right. <laughs> well, some of these questions you likely haven't heard before. So we'll start out. Would you rather win a championship in basketball or win a court case? Oh, my goodness. Um, having won more court cases than championships, uh, <laughs> I'd have to say at this stage, it really depends on the court case. Uh, remember, I used to represent uh, the city of New York and the state of New York against, uh, you know, police brutality. So uh, unfortunately, those are really tough cases to, to win. Uh, now, looking back on it, I probably would like to have one for the victims, one more of those cases, even though you have the evidence, you know, juries were low to convict police officers for, you know, whatever reason. That's a great answer. Would you rather have to complete your JD again from Harvard or only be able to watch the Hallmark Channel for three months during college basketball season? <laughs> I really loved going to law school. I loved being there after playing for 10 years and being out of school for 10 years. It was uh, refreshing, exhilarating, and, and challenging. So I still want to, I'd like to go back. <laughs> okay. Well, that wasn't the answer I was expecting, but I know you don't want to give up your college basketball. Well, my wife loves the Hallmark Channel anyway, so I get to watch <laughs> that too. Okay. All right. Well, the, noted for future questions. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Um, when it's placed between a, the, the bun, yes. <laughs> okay. That's All right. a terrible answer, Len. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather eat brownies with a chance there's rocks in them or eat an entire jar of mayonnaise? Ooh. <laughs> I, I put mayo on my sandwiches, but uh, an entire jar, give me the brownie. Okay. Are you just going to nibble around and hope you don't bite into one? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, who knows? And if I do, I won't chew too heavily. Okay. 
Would you rather be able to speak every language or speak to animals? Interesting. Um, every language. Okay. All right. What pancakes, waffles, or French toast? Pancakes. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's kind of an unpopular answer. I like it. Any specialties pancake? Um, I like banana or chocolate chip. Okay. Or okay. just good old buttermilk. Can't go wrong it's, with it's those. It's all about the syrup, though, man. It's the syrup. <laughs> that's that's true. That's true. We got a couple oh, left. Where are we going with maple syrup or? Yeah, I'm I'm old fashioned, man. Maple syrup is. A, right. I, my grandmother used to try to put uh, was it the cane the cane sugar syrup. Oh yeah. Syrup, you know the, the Cairo alga syrup or whatever the the syrup that Hank Aaron used to uh, used <laughs> to push. You guys are too young for that, but he used to be in Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine uh, pushing this one syrup made out of cane sugar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look if I can find it after. Um, we got a few more here. Would you rather be stranded on an island alone or with the person you hate most? Um, the person I hate most because I'd expect to be a challenge. I would say within a few days, we'd be, uh, we'd be friends. Oh, I love it. Optimism. Would you rather find ten dollars on the ground or find all your missing socks? Uh, all my missing socks, man. You don't know how much of a pain in the ass it is. <laughs> when, <laughs> you know, after doing the wash, I got disparate socks hanging around. There, I, there is a sock thief. There's a universal th sock thief, just like there is tooth fairy. Two more. Would you rather run as fast as a cheetah or fly one mile per hour? Ooh, uh, I'd like to fly. Okay, that's a good answer. And the last one, Len, you shot 41% for your pro career. You had zero three-pointers made, but I give you one uncontested. I thought I made one in the ABA. Uh, uh -oh. I, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll have yeah, to I remember it. that. I'll, I'll have to stat check that. I oh. give you one, un one shot uncontested at the elbow right now. Are you making it? At this moment, at this stage, um, I think I could, okay, because because that's where I used to shoot from anyway. Yeah, that that I did look at. That was your sweet spot. Uh, I love high. the I love the confidence. Good Let high it. low guy. It's muscle memory. You never lose that. Uh, that is very true. Len, thank you so much for joining us. It was a real treat having you on. I appreciate it, guys. It was fun. Thanks. And for those that want to see more of him, you can follow him on Twitter at Len Elmore, just his name. Len, before we log off, is there anything that you'd like to plug or to tell our audience? Um, nothing except, as I said, from the outset, you know, we're, we're a nation that uh, needs to get united, uh, get behind democracy and, and understanding that, um, you know, a house divided will, will fall. And, um, you know, that's Lincoln, but, you know, that's so prophetic right now. And, and I think after the events of June, of June, of January 6th, that uh, we need to find a way to, to, to unite because this is the greatest country on earth and we need to continue that. I just felt so passionate listening to Len's speech. If you are listening to this and you're not following him on Twitter, make sure you click that follow button. He is a great follow, has plenty of great insight. Len, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you.